<laughs> I'm sorry, you were about to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, I was wanting to add into us that many times people say, you know, that what is my destiny? Why I'm born, for example. So people think that, you know, there's like one sentence, as you said. Yeah. Okay, you are destined. What's my purpose? I want to know my purpose. <laughs> yeah. So now they say that, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, for example, his purpose was that um, he helped uh, India get rid of the British in one sense. But that I, I don't think that was his only purpose. I mean, because as a husband, he will have a different purpose. You know, as a father, he would have had a different purpose. So that when you say that Mahatma Gandhi's purpose was to you know, liberate India from the British, then you are only seeing the aspect of his 10th house, which he is doing at a you know larger scale for the society. But as an individual, he must uh, have had so many other aspects. Which yeah, he had, a, he had children. He, he, he had karma and duties and responsibilities and karma with all areas of life, just like the rest of us, just because we're known. Exactly. Now, now, that's a different thing. That's actually what is called swadharma, which is a different... And when, when people ask about that sort of purpose thing, what they're what they're wanting to know is really the Swadharma. And it's an important thing to address that we all want to know that higher um, individual awakening that we're going through. Like what is that? Because I think that for, that for the most part, we really evolve and develop personally through our contribution because it shows the sacrifices that we're willing to make. And that really brings out a lot of personal individuality and transformation and growth you know as someone who is striving to make a bigger impact it brings out a whole lot of things on a personal level that don't happen until you sort of get in the game so yeah. it's, that really brings out a whole lot of different things and it unfortunately also this is one of the things that's confusing it it gets sort of condensed or sort of collapsed into this idea of career what's my career it's not really the same thing. Again, it's kind of a Western word because we're so materialistic. We think everything's about our career or that the 10th house of Svadharma and purpose literally translates into career when it really doesn't. There are people who's, especially you see a lot with women and with mothers, especially where it's very clear to see that they're in, in many ways, their, their life path to a higher self-awareness and that sort of higher personal purpose really revolves around, first of all, things that have to do with motherhood and raising their kids and these kinds of things. So it's a complicated issue, but I get what you're saying is that, is that you know, we have a purpose on a multitude of levels and, we, and we're trying to actually do all of them well. <laughs> yeah, and regarding that only, we said like uh, regarding uh, motherhood and etc. So many times, you know, people, uh, some ladies, especially some housewives in India, they sometimes mail me or when I talk to them, they say that, oh, actually, you know, I did not do anything in my life. And I'm like, oh, that's such a ridiculous statement. You have been 24 hours. What? We're working harder than us. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you feel that you are not doing anything in life? It's just that you are not the CEO of any company or you do not have any post or position. You do not have people saluting to you, you know. Because that's something which is called as name and fame. No, that has nothing to do with your actions. You may do actions, but you may not be famous. <laughs> there are some people who hardly do anything and then they become so much famous overnight. So we should never think that uh, if you do not have an external position or any recognition that we are not doing actions in this world. It's a very bad attitude. And so to come back, one of the things that I, that I realized, and it's the reason that I made it this way, is that, is that once we understand that there's karma and that we have tendencies, then we want to know what are they. And literally, this is what astrology shows us, is the specifics, the specific facets of consciousness that we're dealing with in this lifetime. They're like the specific instruments that we're playing, that either we get to play when we're present and conscious, or that are playing us when we're unconscious. It's the, these planetary energies and also nakshatras and whatnot are the energies of life. And we're supposed to know them and comprehend them and understand them so that we're able to play them and master our own reality rather than getting overwhelmed. And one of the most important facets of the planets themselves are the gunas. And I mentioned here, I said, once we introduce consciousness, those things we want so much, those desires for happiness, become shared with others rather than gobbled up and consumed by us. 
and those angry, dark, and scary ideas that we inflict on others become absorbed into our own mind, leading to courage, to the capacity to persevere through difficulty and, and real spiritual growth. So what I'm doing here actually is talking about the gunas and the nature of the planets, because what's supposed to happen with the gunas especially, you know, the planets have sattvic, tamasic, and rajasic natures. The sattvic planets are the ones that are supposed to be shared selflessly. We're supposed to share those energies, and we do in their highest when they're functioning at their highest, which means Jupiter, Moon, and Sun energy. And what those things are in our consciousness are things that we love to share. We just want to share it because it, it benefits others. And that's Jupiter, which is teachings. We all want our teachings and our hopes and our inspirations to benefit others. The moon, which is the heart and love, just like a mother's love. The mother just wants to share the love with the child. They don't expect anything back. Just like a great teacher doesn't expect anything back in return. And also the sun, which is literally the sun, is the one who shares all his energy so that we can all live. Notice this about the sun. We're all benefiting because the sun is still shining in the sky. The sun never asks us to appreciate him. They used to, and they used to do sun salutations, but the sun is the reason everything is here. So again, it's, those sattvic planets are pure generosity. And then the rajasic planets, Mercury and Venus, are about equality. Like I use the example of Venus wanting to share happiness. If my happiness comes at your expense, then I'm not happy either. That's Venus. Mercury says, I don't just want to talk. I want to listen and I want to engage and I want to harmonize our energy through language and then learn things. That's Rajas. It's about an equal exchange with Rajas. And again, what winds up happening is we, is we misuse the guna. And Mars, Saturn, and the nodes they're about tamasic energy, and we're supposed to keep the tamasic energy to ourself. We're supposed to keep our anger and our fear to ourself and use that as the great powers that we need to transform. Rather than to inflict it on others and try to change them, we need to change ourselves. Rather than point out all the things that you did wrong, so I'm going to destroy you and humiliate you, I need to look at the things that I'm doing wrong and have the courage, the emotional courage to change and transform, face my own fear of death, face my own ignorance, face my own confusion. But instead we do it backwards. We dump our fear and anger onto others. We try to keep the good stuff for ourselves rather than share it equally. We wanna be inspired, we want to be empowered rather than giving it away. So this is one of the deepest lessons of planets is understanding the guna. It's foundational in all astrology and in all yogic teachings is misuse of the guna. So people can take from this in any, in any, um, any dasha cycle, any transit. The problem with Mars is that you don't have the strength and the courage to hold on to your anger and allow it to transform and purify your mind. And instead, you dump it onto somebody else. What we're supposed to dump onto someone else is the sattva. We're supposed to dump the love and the light and the teaching and inspiration. That's what we're supposed to just give away to others with no expectation. Instead, we dump the fear and the anger and the control and the manipulation. Does that make sense? Perfectly. You just summarized uh, what goes on in social media, I think, these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes on everywhere. But it's very important. And again, this, these are the things we're supposed to know. This is why, again, this is just very basic understanding Sanatana Dharma. This is why the Rishi says that we're supposed to know this stuff. Again, it doesn't mean we're not even reading an astrology chart yet. We're just talking about the basic structures of Sanatana Dharma. And just think of how much that benefits someone to know and understand, okay, the specific energies of my karma that I'm grappling with have to do with the nine grahas. Okay, those are the specific energies. It's not just somehow stuff is happening. No, it's these specific energies. And each one of these specific energies also has a very specific motivation. Three of them are completely motivated to selflessness and giving energy away. And that's what I'm supposed to do with my hopes and inspirations, with my love, selfless love and with my power in the sense of wanting to empower others. 
And so th two of them are meant to be shared equally. And the other three or four, when you consider Rahu and Ketu as being two, I'm supposed to keep and work through myself. These are my problems that I need to work through. I need to be more disciplined. I need to face my fears. Just understanding that and knowing how many mistakes are made because we misuse the planetary energy is really important. So all these things must be kept in mind when we're evaluating karma, whether it's with dashas or transits. All the karmic energy is a range of possibility, and we need skill to evaluate which part of the karma is happening because of the dasha, which part is developing because of the transit, and things like that. Does that make sense? Perfect. So one of the things, and I have this diagram here, which shows the sort of karmic frame. This is from my book, Yoga and Vedic Astrology. And it's, it's really just about how, as you see, circumstances from the past are framing the present. Like your present moment, it's based on everything that's ever happened before. Then you have the circumstances in the present, which are ready for action. Now you're in the present, you're on that, that kind of knife edge, that razor's edge is called the moment, is kind of in the middle of all of that. Then actions that you've just taken in the present, which are going to create the future, they kind of spiral back. And then these past actions, which start to ripen for the present moment. So this is kind of a way to understand karma in a way that is not just turned into this um, one dimensional, you know, what comes around goes around. Karma is probably the most misunderstood concept in all of Indian thinking. And that's saying something because a lot of stuff is misunderstood. Karma is probably the most because it's not a, it's not a, a series of retribution. Karma is literally the, it's the effect of your preconceptions on your actions. And it's not something, it's a process. It's this process. And we tend to look at it from one point of view. First of all, we tend to think that it's all the bad stuff. Well, that's karma. Karma's going to get you. Karma's a bitch and all this stuff. It's simply the effect of, it's the universal law. And there's no judgment in karma. This is one of the biggest things. It's never unfair. And it's no, there's no judgment in it. One of the things I use as an example for karma, I talk about this in the book quite a bit, is if you look at it like a, like a universal law, then it makes a lot more sense. And look at it as something such as gravity. Okay, because gravity is a universal law. It's a, it's a scientific law. And so is karma. But it's, it's the science of spirituality. It's, it, it's a science of dharma. But dharma, which is the truth, is managed by karma. So, for example, if you look at gravity, gravity is not good or bad. There is no good gravity or bad gravity, just like there's no good karma or bad karma. Gravity is not good when it keeps your body stuck to the earth and keeps you from flying off into space. That's when it's good. And it's bad when it pulls a child off the 10th store balcony and squashes them on the ground, or when it pulls an airplane out of the sky and kills everybody. It's not good when, you know, it keeps all your body tissues together and bad when you break your leg because you fell out of the tree. It's neither one. It's simply a law. And we need to understand the law. And if we understand the law, then we're usually on the good side of it. Sometimes we're not. And sometimes we get in an airplane and unfortunately things happen. But nobody ever blames gravity. Have you ever heard that? Oh, that gravity did it again. We're going to do something about gravity. <laughs> Very interesting. Because we understand the nature of gravity. But the same is true with karma. It's not good when it rewards you and bad when it punishes you. Quote, neither one of those things are even real. They're just effects on consciousness. They're just emotions. And they're, those things are there to alert you to something because you're not just this hunk of meat that is doing things. That is the illusion. The illusion is that you're the separate person, that that's who you really are. And that all of the things that you're doing is actually you doing it. And that all of the effects that come back is actually you experiencing them in your totality. It's not. It's you in a limited sense. And that's why you're here. 
You're here to awaken from that illusion of limitation and connect to something beyond. And again, this is why all of that context needs to be understood. And if we don't understand that, we don't understand any of it. Then we just grapple and pull at some very surface understanding and then interpret the entirety of Vedic astrology through that limited point of view. And this is why people interpret astrology through all these limited points of view. Because, well, it must be bad. I didn't get what I want. I don't feel good. Somebody died. So it's, my, it's the bad karma. Well, this is the good karma because I liked it. It felt good. Not, none of it is good or bad. It's karma doing its job, which is to awaken you to the truth. And the truth is you're not just this separate person. That's the real truth, the one that we hardly ever really get to. What do you have to say to that? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's perfectly true about <laughs> gravity that you said, you know. It's like there's no plus minus there. And there's another misconception which people have about karma, which I have seen is that, okay, I did some bad thing. Now I will do something good. So the good and bad will cancel out each other. So suppose I go and beat somebody and then I will go and donate some money to somebody else. No, it doesn't work like that. Well, it does, but, and, and the thing is, it, it does kind of work like that, but that's missing the point. That that's what we're saying. And again, you can go into texts and scriptures and you will hear them talk about it this way. And yes, it does still work on that way. Just like astrology still works to be able to predict whether or not you'll get the husband or whether or not you'll lose the job. It still works on that level. Karma still works on that level, but that's not the point it's like you can look at your computer and look at the screen and look at the surface but underneath it all the computer doesn't work because there's a screen the computer works because there's an operating system and a processor and microchips doing thousands and billions of calculations per second that's what's behind what you see on the surface it's the same way with the world we see this the world like we see the surface of the ocean and with the surface of the ocean, underneath it all, there's a whole lot. We're just like the skin of our body. We see each other's appearance, but that's not why we're here. We're not here because of our skin. We're here because all of our organs are functioning and digesting our food. That's what's producing the possibility of an animated body that's still alive. So we focus on the skin. We focus on the surface of karma and the most mundane, shallow interpretation possible because that's where we live, because we live on that shallow surface. And all of life and, and the way astrology is so powerful is it helps us go much deeper than just this surface interaction with the world, with our karma, with astrology. Again, it's going to work on the surface, but that's the least important part. That's why I say the least important part of a reading is these predictions. And again, I don't necessarily tell the person that, but by the time I explain something to them, <clears throat> by the time I explain their relationships to them in literally five or seven minutes, they don't even care about the prediction anymore. They want to hear more of, because now they're empowered, because now they know what they're doing wrong. And that's actually what they want to know. They want to understand themselves. Just like we want to understand life. We don't want to think that the universe is out to get us. We want to understand that it's beautiful and loving and benevolent and we and that we're just not understanding it. And so explaining karma and explaining these things to people this way is this is what I tell my students. This is the best stuff you'll probably ever do for someone in a reading. And yes, I know they all come and they want they give you the they want you to give the predictions and you can give it to them and my students will do it, you know. But the thing that really blows them away and shifts their uh, their understanding is all of this stuff, correctly interpreting all of those things, this ascendant, the functional nature, this, that, and bringing this depth to the person that they didn't have before. And even things like karma, explain these things to people because they don't know. They're certainly not taught that a lot. They're not told that's what it is. And in the West, especially, we have a very corrupt view of all these things. Karma is probably the worst. And again, and astrology, it feeds right into what people think astrology is as well, directly. <laughs> right into it all the good and bad this and that people don't even understand who they are they don't even understand what karma is and of course they don't know they don't understand it they're like oh i know what that is <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah and that thing is also there uh, in the i mean in youtube you know that 
oh my sun sign like uh, one person asked me recently that uh, i've got a son and he's just born recently and his uh, moon is in capricorn so can you predict uh, what kind of a future he's going to have oh that's i know so then i asked him a question that uh, suppose i tell you tomorrow that there's a boy who is born in australia what kind of a future he will have in australia so can you say yeah. about that he said no no how can you say you know there there are unlimited possibilities i mean exactly <laughs> yeah 